Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where we talk about TV shows of the supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of The Magicians. A crazy interesting episode. A lot of stuff to break down, so let's get to it. Obviously, you know, Quentin's trying to buy himself more time with the monster inside of Elliot, trying to find that next piece that they need. And lo and behold, they get help from uh, Pete. Which is interesting because Julia was kind of pissed about it because let's not forget the last time Julia and Pete met was like the whole circumstances around him erasing her uh, fiance's memory of her making it so that they never met. Yeah, it's enough to kind of hold a grudge because, you know, it's like, yeah, him and Morena kind of fucked up Julia's life. So it's like, of course, you're gonna be a little pissed. And even like he didn't like he's like, oh, I don't like the fact that she the way she said my name like that. Like, oh, like there wasn't like it wasn't cool or whatever. But I love Pete being like, okay, yeah, this is all connected to a dragon, which dragons are real. And Quentin's like, yeah, I know. I met three. And it's like, oh. And you can see Pete almost kind of being like, oh, I guess it's really not that cool then. Uh, it is interesting, though, the conversation between Pete and um, Katie I thought was interesting because Pete is willing to follow her. He's like, you saw how loyal I was with Marina. The fact that it matters, everything you've kind of kicked in overdrive, you saved my life, so I kind of owe you a debt in a sense. So, but, you know, you have... Katie wanted to turn into girl that started all this by um, killing people. Like, the fact is that the library hasn't found out who's responsible for all this yet. And it's interesting because, you know, Pete's like, no, the fact that she did the right thing kind of jumps on in his revolution. But Katie's like, no, she didn't do the right thing. She made things harder for us. It's like the library was already an issue, but now they've literally targeted us. So if we don't turn her in, they're just going to keep their eyes on her, us. If we can just turn her in and make all the responsibility hers, at least this gives us some room to breathe, essentially. So sadly, she kind of got obviously turned in. Granted, we never saw that in this episode, so I would assume it happened, but we'll have to wait and see uh, when it ends up becoming that, what ends up happening because of that, you know? Because obviously Katie is obviously stepping more and more into that role. It's interesting because obviously Penny 23 shows up and he tells Katie what, you know, Penny said, and obviously it pisses her off because it's like, he's not coming back, so like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Because it's not like she can yell at him and stuff like that. They've always had like this rocky relationship of up and downs, and it's just you know, after all that, it's kind of like this is the way it ends. I don't even get to, you know, get a proper goodbye from you. It's just kind of like you tell me you love me and I have to live with that. You know, it's like, it is kind of shitty that he just kind of leaves her with that. And that's it. It's not like he said it himself. He had to send Penny 23, the man who looks like the man that you love, who is basically the same man that you love just from a different timeline. Of course, it's, it, that just adds an extra layer of fuck this, you know, so it's just kind of interesting. Lo and behold, uh, tracking down the whole dragon situation, and Harold the Herald, he just went up for the job, but it is just kind of interesting that, that he ended up getting that job. They're tracking down some elixir for the dragon. They'll be able to get whatever they want, him and Julia. And I love the whole situation of it's like, yeah, Poppy's back in the story. I was like, ah, oh, that's so interesting. And um, lo and behold, she's pregnant. I'm like, what? What? And it didn't even cross my mind. It took a while for me to think like, oh, Quentin could be the dad because like him and Poppy did hook up last year. So I was like, oh, that's crazy. And then it's like, wow, he's going to be the dad and everything, which I think on some level, you know, Quentin probably is thinking, you know, because obviously he recently lost his dad. So probably in his mind, he's kind of thinking like, oh, what kind of dad he's going to be. And then there's the whole thing of like, oh, yeah, it turns out Poppy wrote some dragon, you know, erotica. And I even love it that there's censored stuff in this. Uh, it's almost like a hentai. Just like, it's, it's so weird. And it turns out like, oh, Poppy might have impregnated herself. Even I had to audibly go, Jesus, Poppy, you literally inseminated yourself with dragon jizz. It's like, wait, what? That's crazy. She's even going as far as saying like, they are the universal donors. I'm like, oh my God. I was like, I knew you were obsessed with dragons, Poppy, but to the extent you're like, oh, I'm gonna have a dragon hybrid baby. But then it turns out, no, she was lying. It's a normal human baby, which is interesting because the actress who plays Poppy, Felicia Day, I had no idea. Uh, it's actually a mom in real life. I'm wondering was she actually pregnant when she filmed this? I don't know, you know, production schedule and stuff like that. There's no telling how long ago that was actually filmed. She might have actually been pregnant at the time. I don't, because I don't, I think she has a, a little girl. I don't know how old her daughter is. Um, and the reason why I know that, because of Inside of You of Michael Rosenbaum. If you don't know what that is, it's Michael Rosenbaum's podcast where he interviews people and Johnny gets inside of them. Just and That's a whole tangent, you know, in itself. But that's where I found out about that, because I typically don't look up in information about actors and actresses like that, because like, it's like, oh, their personal life is their personal life. I feel eh, weird about knowing stuff about them, because it's like, on a personal life, it's a whole thing. I'm going into tangent. 
just know I didn't know she had a kid until, you know, so I'm wondering was this this or was it just kind of a happenstance of like, oh, yeah, you had a kid and just like, oh, you're, you know, because they make a point for her to be like, yeah, I'm having a normal human baby. It makes me think she might have been pregnant at the time. But nevertheless, either way, I thought that was kind of just twist upon twist. And it turns out the baby has like this aphrodisiac, not aphrodisiac, this, um, what is the word I'm thinking of? Whatever the case, uh, makes it so that you kind of get sucked into it, and you have Quentin being like, oh yeah, Falcor, and the poppy's like, we're not calling him Falcor, he's like, will you just give me this, and just getting obsessive and stuff like that, because uh, it turns out it's not just Quentin that was kind of sucked up in all this, it's Poppy, because the whole thing was like, Poppy's a habitual liar, it's like, yeah, you know, because even when Poppy was like, the fact is, she was like, what you... Because, like, Quentin's, like, oh, the fact is, like, from the beginning, he was like, yeah, you're probably the one behind this because you're a dragon-obsessed person who's willing to do whatever. And she's like, give me an example. And she stops. She's like, right, I just thought about it. She's like, probably th immediately thought of all the times she betrayed and lied to Quentin. So it's like, yeah, let me let me not just, let me not even open up that can of worms. And then, like, Penny gets controlled by it. But Julia doesn't, kind of benefits. Because she even said it herself, like, magic doesn't seem like it works on her, which is kind of interesting. It's like, not only are you immortal, magic kind of has no effect on you. So, that was interesting. And I love they're threatening the baby. I also love that the dragon ended up taking the baby because I guess it belonged to the baby because it belonged to another dragon. So, it's kind of like, oh, I guess it's worthwhile in the end. But, like, everyone kind of being so broken up about it and everything. So... What I thought was really interesting, obviously they got the item they needed in the end, but was the whole thing of like, oh yeah, my mistress, she was like, yeah, figure your situation out, try to make it as temporary as possible. I'm like, why is Julia's like like little state that she's in such an issue? Because, you know, because it's interesting because for her, it's like she basically trapped in immortality. They have to watch everyone around her die, you know, and like Penny kind of can understand because for him, it's like as a traveler, we're alone, but also not alone at the same time. The whole getting inside of people's heads type of situations, you know, so it's like having that connectivity like that, it's understandable, like... I'm sure there's an aspect of loneliness even when being surrounded by other people's voices and stuff like that probably makes you feel even more alone in certain regards. But Julia's trying to figure her whole situation. But like I said, why is that such an issue Like that she figures that out immediately? She needs to find her truth. Um, she needs to find, what was it called again? The Binder. I don't know whether that's, I would assume that's supposed to be a person or a creature or a thing. Someone, I guess, that kind of binds her nature back together. Because it's supposed to be kind of, essentially, I guess, her reverting back to her goddess status. Like, maybe there's some kind of, like, cosmic unbalance that's created because, like, she's trapped between the world of mortal and maybe she's on some demigod level stuff. And may, Well, no, because, like, you know, uh, Reynard had another kid, so it's not that uh, big of a deal. You know, like, that didn't throw off any balance, him having, you know, a, a, a demigod kid. So it's, maybe it's just the fact is that she's a full-on goddess, and she's kind of stuck in a medium. And like I said, maybe that causes some cosmic shenanigans to happen or something like that. For other people to be worried about Julia's status, or maybe the fact is, it throws off things off kilter. Because, like, if a god exists, and then something happens like that, that in itself, like, you know, her situation kind of falling from that position. Like, maybe, like, there's a cosmic balance to be like, oh, yeah, there's this many gods or goddesses. Even if they die, there's some balance to it. And her reverting to her state kind of plays into being all balanced. I have no idea. You know, but it's going to be interesting to find out, for one, more about what she is and how she can go back to potentially being a goddess. It's actually kind of sad, too, because playing into what I was talking about earlier, she had talked about the fact is, one time her and Quentin were the same, humans. Uh, you know, and now that kind of seems like a distant memory in a certain regard. Um, it's interesting, too, because the whole conversation came up about, like, oh, yeah, like, pregnancies of kind of, like, these magical kinds can make you a little crazy, because Julia was talking about the whole situation, you know, because she'd been in that situation with the whole Reynard situation. She was in that situation at one point time in herself, so she kind of understood what the whole Poppy thing. Uh, what was also interesting is, like, Poppy's discussion. She was like, yeah, I was super against the whole, you know, pregnancy thing when it happened, blah, 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 blah. I was going to take care of it, but then kind of got sidetracked by it. And then it's like, okay, I'll find these people good parents and family. And Quentin's like, oh, that's good. But then she was like, you kind of convinced me to not do that. And he's like, wait, what? And she's like, I'm going I'm to raise this kid. It's going to be awesome and stuff like that. And you have Quentin be like, no, 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 no. You shouldn't do that just because of who Poppy is. Poppy's you know, wild and crazy like that. Uh, but then she's like, but Quentin's like, am I the father? And, you know, she's like, no, did you want to be? Which I think on some level he did, because I almost let slip my mind until that conversation came. I was like, right, Quentin technically was a dad in a different timeline, so I think memories of that probably tugged at 
his, you know, paternal instincts, you know, that need to be a, or want to be a dad. Plus, like I said, on top of that, losing his actual father too. So I'm sure all that kind of plays some part in it. But he was like, I don't know, you know, I, I'm curious, like, is this going to affect his decisions going forward? I wonder will that ever tie back in or is it, you know, it's an alternate timeline. I mean, to be fair, we know timelines are playing a part in all of this too, just because of all this, like, you know, Penny 23 and Morena and all that. So it's like, yeah, it plays a role, but it's like, will that timeline ever play a role? You would think maybe in some shape or form, but maybe not. I mean, the show does have a tendency to kind of throw out storylines that take a little while, but they'll eventually kind of circle back around. So we'll see if anything ever comes about him and, well, the child him and Elliot ended up raising. Comma, you also have to consider the fact is not only was that in an alternate timeline, it was alter an alternate timeline of the past, too. So that adds an extra layer to the complication of the whole timeline and everything. But nevertheless, I did like uh, Poppy being like, OK, but you're also going to be this baby's godfather. So, yeah, so that's definitely going to be interesting. I hope we do get to see more Poppy because Poppy's wild and crazy. Plus, being pregnant and just that whole situation is going to be interesting to see whether that what comes about that. Um, another aspect to the episode was the whole Zelda, uh, Henry, and Ella situation of like, okay, we mutually help each other. You help me with the whole Sheila situation. I'll help you with your spell. It's interesting because we learned from uh, Alice the whole situation about that world. Basically, those creatures are known as shards. They're kind of echoes of the real person, you know, Harriet. Uh, which the sad thing is, we never saw Victoria, so that might mean Victoria might not be alive anymore. Potentially, we don't know. But basically, the spell they want to make uh, needs to, it's kind of like a beacon, but it's a cooperative spell, and it needs between mother and daughter. And lo and behold, Alice has to go visit Stephanie, which is awkward because this probably has to be the first time she's seen her mom since her dad died, so that adds an er element to it. But immediately getting right back into the whole arguing and everything. Um, I love that Carol shows up and everything, and I love that, like, Alice is like, oh, the library's here. You turned me over, didn't you? Of course you did, Mom, you know, because obviously them going at it, they've always had issues. But then she's like, I would never turn you in. The fact is, I'm turning Carol in. And Carol's like, what? She's like, Carol, what? Yeah. And I'm like, because the moment it's like, the moment they were like, oh, Stephanie's kind of being held hostage. The librarian's outside of her saying that. I'm like, oh, my God, she's turned in Carol. That's interesting. But I also kind of, because, I mean, Alice's point, though, because Carol tried to be like, you should know, like, look, I didn't turn you in, so that shows you progress. But it's like, the fact of the matter is you still turned in your best friend. She's like, I, you know, kind of wish I wasn't your daughter and stuff like that. I'm better off. And, like, Carol, almost like she was about to hit Alice, and she kind of shrank back. I wonder if was her mom ever abusive like that. I mean, I know, like, me saying that's kind of like, I really... <laughs> That depends on your lines. You know, some people don't look at it as some people look at it as discipline. Other people look at abuse. I'm not even going to touch that situation because I think it comes down to the person. It's it's just a whole thing. So I'm not going to really comment on that. But the thing is, um, I wonder did that come up a lot? The fact is that she reacted like that. I, I don't know. And the fact is, Stephanie kind of reached like that. Maybe Daniel kind of brought the balance because her mom never seemed like that. Because her mom's always seemed much like a hippie. But to be fair, I think it's a combination of Stephanie and Daniel that kind of worked like that. But the thing is, for her, it's like I would never turn you in because I know you're, you know, you're great. You had the potential for you know good and evil. But the fact of the matter is, you're my daughter. I would never turn you in because she loves her. Because it's like at the end of the day, you have you're all I have. I lost Charlie. I lost Daniel. Like we have each other. And then when it was all said and done, Alice realizes it's like the one that was kind of keeping the spell from working. Because for Alice, she always felt like, oh, I wasn't good enough to be your daughter. There's all these issues and stuff like that. But it's like for Alice, it's like I'm the one who was kind of preventing who you know, didn't want to be your daughter. It's not like you don't want me to be your daughter. I was the one that was like that because I was thinking like, you know, once dad was gone because we had such issues that you'd be done with me. So that's the whole issue, which is super sad and, you know, the complicated nature of their relationship. And then Stephanie be like, oh, sweetie, so you're admitting that was your fault. I'm like, I love it, Stephanie. You had this heartwarming moment and then you literally just spit on it. I love it. So at least they made progress in the relationship. I mean, I hope, you know, Things were always going to be complicated, but at least they have each other at the end of the day. So it's like, yay, that's a victory. And then lo and behold, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I love even Henry being like, hey, in this one moment, everyone wins. So let's enjoy it before everything gets fucked up with the next five seconds. Immediately go, oh, and yes, it's immediately over. Because it turns out uh, uh, Sheila joined 
the librarians and it's just a whole complicated thing of like no you don't do that they're evil people but she was like no they're doing good but it's like they they are comprom they're corruptible people they they are they have their own reasons for doing things and they kind of go about things shitty ways and stuff like that because alice kind of sees them for who they are but sheila didn't she's like oh we're doing good and you know and I guess in Zelda's mind, it's okay because it's like, hey, because Sheila's part of the library, her book's in the poison room, so no one's going to know about her connection to you and all this. So you're safe. So it kind of, Alice gets what she wants to a certain degree because it's like, oh, you know, she's, Sheila isn't being held captive because she's part of the library now. Plus, like, Sheila doesn't have to worry about her book being hidden away to protect her or whatever because she's part of the library now. Plus, her book's in the poison room. So it was almost it's almost like a sly win, you know? Because I even love Henry beyond it. <laughs> he kind of snorts and then leaves the room of just being like, well, just shit just compounds upon itself, you know? So it's just kind of sad in the end. Because I think for Alice, she thought like, oh, maybe I did some good. I helped someone. Which even Sheila's like, I'd be thankful for. It. But now it's like, now Sheila's in their hands. Just another person who's fallen victim to the library's BS, essentially, you know? So, because, I mean, to be fair, Alice was sent where she was meant to. So it's a, you know, a domino effect of like, this was meant to happen. Because I guess in the long run, there will be some good that comes about it. Because all those events have led to things being where they are right now. Her helping out Zelda to get Harriet back, potentially. That's all part of some grand design, essentially. You know, as we kind of learned with the whole episode uh, last week and everything. Like, everyone's side stories. Which we should also talk about Margot and Finn. And I love Finn being like, wait, you're here? I thought this was all about, you know, my, you know, this is, this is my thing, and, oh, like, you're tagging along, because Margo's like, yeah, all the dreams were about me, obviously. Also, Finn's pretty good at throwing knives. Uh, the fact is, we've never actually, I mean, she is the daughter of a blacksmith, uh, a blade master, so, of course, but it's like, oh, yeah, but we've never seen her in action. We've seen her pull out the daggers and stuff like that, but we've never seen her kind of go full crazy, but I did, like, she threw the knife at Margo, tried to, she's like, yeah, don't, don't forget to do your whole knife thing, because uh, you had uh, her being like, whoa, 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 Margo being like, whoa, 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 Finn. Don't act like I'm catching feelings for Josh, because that's, that's too much right there. And she's like, right. They visit the lady who's supposed to be the prophet, and then it's like, oh, yeah, she's just having them doing yard work and stuff like that. And I love Finn is on point with her references, because, like, Margot references Mr. Miyagi, and she talks about, and then, like, Finn, you know, responds, talking about the Karate Kid. And she's like, when the, and Margot's like, when the hell did you have time to watch the Karate Kid? I mean, let's not forget her and... Frail were alone for a while, kind of experiencing life on Earth. So I guess at some point, like at that time, I mean, I guess at some well, because because she went, couldn't have watched it in Fillory, so it had to be some time basically during season three when that ended up happening when she was kind of separated from everyone. So there's that. Uh, what was that other reference she made? Right when the fake uh, prophet lady was like, "Oh yeah, you gotta find the Napster," and then she's like, "What?" And then Finn's like, "Oh, you mean like the music sharing site?" And Margaret looks at her like, "When the hell did you have time to absorb all this information?" And she's like, "Wow, I really underestimated you, Finn, but no more." So when the time came, and I love that, like Finn and Margot's like, "You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cover myself in butter, and I'm gonna slide, and I'm gonna ask Josh for forgiveness." Because it's interesting, because he's running the uh, kingdom and everything, and I'm like. Oh, that makes sense. Let's not forget he was temporary king back in season two for a little while. I mean, granted, he never really had to do anything too crazy, but I guess he was in that position long enough for it. But like, oh, he can take care of things while Margot's going. And then like, Finn's kind of shocked. She's like, oh wow. Oh, and you want me to give you away the wedding? But we don't really know each other that. All right, this is a dream. And so. And it turns out Napster is, in fact, a cat lady. So that's interesting. And I love that whole spiel about, like, you know, uh, Finn puts, you know, everyone else first. I mean, the, I mean, it is kind of messed up. You never really think about it. It's like, oh, yeah, the girl who was raised to marry the king. It's like, of course, she's just naturally going to put other people's needs before. It's like, do you have any kind of, like, what was it, confidence in yourself and stuff like that? She's like, yeah, of course I do. I think I do. Maybe. And she's like... You know, you're up here asking about Margot's destiny and stuff like that. She's like, all right, I'm going to ask about mine. And it's like, and your destiny is about Queen High King Margot. And it's like, Jesus, really? What was the freaking point of you putting me through all that, kind of building me up? It'd be like, yeah, I'm going to focus on my own destiny when it turns out my destiny is connected to Margot. Turns out her destiny is for her that when it's all said and done, for you to stand by the High King around other, you know, leaders are gathered up. And then you are to take the throne from her bloody if necessary and it's like jesus it's like holy crap what what is that all about why is that the case you know i mean to be fair she was kind of taking over the role while margo was gone anyway but it's like but then once again lord fresh made the whole point of like margo's going to lead 
she's going to learn what it's like to lead alone. So that's why I'm kind of thinking like when it's all said and done, probably not a lot of people are going to be there. Like there might not be any Finn around or any, even any Josh potentially. I'm curious to see what, like what the hell did that mean? Because he said she would learn what it means to rule alone. Maybe meaning that, you know, I don't know. Like I said, I assume that, you know, just because all the people that were important or would end up dying. But I don't know, especially with this new development with Finn. Will Finn actually do it? Maybe this will be connected to, like, the fairy eye. Maybe, like, Margot will see it coming in some shape or form. I have no idea. Maybe Finn won't go through it, but she believes this is her destiny and she wants to find her own destiny. It's so interesting because we've seen kind of all this build up off of, like, oh, yeah, everyone had the... Because even Mar like, at the beginning, like I said, Finn was like, yeah, I kind of thought this was my thing after last episode. Kind of one of the stories they focused on was hers. It's kind of like, oh, this is supposed to be my journey and everything. And here's one of the main characters coming in kind of trying to screw up my story in a certain sense you know it's just it's funny like i said it's just genius how they kind of like tie the stories like that from both like within the confines of the story but also from like a fourth wall breaking type of perspective to kind of put it like that so it's definitely going to be interesting to see what where this all takes us going forward into the next episode but really that's all i want to talk about so the next time we meet be happy be safe little light to the force and enjoy it good day and good